Hi everybody, my name is Jeremy, this is Red Means Recording, and welcome to my second video in a series of four videos getting you up to speed in VCV Rack and Eurorack in general. VCV Rack is a free virtual Eurorack environment where we can do all the fun stuff that we would do with hardware modular on your computer for free. And uh, it's an amazing resource for people that are interested in getting into modular and for people who uh, maybe want to try out some concepts without having to um, buy a new module just to do it. We have an amazing library with stuff in here. Um, I'm gonna go up to my library real quick and show you the stuff that I've got. This is all free. If you wanna pause the video real quick and grab these things to work alongside me, I can't promise I'm gonna be working with all of these, but um, and I don't want you to not have something that I call upon to do that. You're gonna open up your library like I just did. Go to Browse VCV Library. You'll search for one of the things that I had on screen, like the FACO. Click the manufacturer's name and then hit subscribe. Hey, and you should subscribe to this channel too. Aha, like and subscribe. Uh, once you've done that, you'll see it pop up in the library up here and uh, you will be able to close VCV Rack, open it up again, and you'll have all that good stuff. So the first video was about creating a subtractive synth voice in VCV Rack, in Eurorack. And we went over things like volt per octave, gate, uh, VCAs, ADSRs, like an envelope generator, filters, LFOs, um, just the real basic stuff that we take for granted when it comes to synthesizers, basically, like any synthesizer like a, a subtractive synthesizer or a hardware synthesizer that maybe you own. Just all that stuff that's sort of built into it. Um, we got to do that ourselves in VCV um, and in Eurorack. Since we have to do all that stuff in here, it's important to have a basic understanding of how that works. And that's what we did in the first video. So check that out if you are new to this. This video is going to be about sequencing clocks and gates. Um, uh, basically things that will allow us to create events in time for us. I think we're going to use um, not a subtractive synth voice in this case. We're going to use a uh, built-in macro oscillator. So let's get that started. Um, on screen, you can see that I have a MIDI to CB converter. I'm not sure if we're going to use this. We have a mixer uh, from Hora. This is a, a nice mixer with aux sends on it. Um, again, it's free, so grab that if you want. I have the master of that attached to my audio out right here, one and two. This is the master out of that. And this gives us eight channels to work with. We can do panning and we can do aux sends for effects, which is really, really nice. I have perhaps more scopes than I need down here, but these are really, really useful. Um, these come with VCV Rack, uh, just really awesome ways to see what signals are doing, and we will uh, depend on these quite a bit. So the basics of what we need right now are the mixer and our audio output, so go ahead and get that set up if you're following along. The next thing we need to add is something that's going to make sound for us. So let us do that. Um, I'm going to right-click and search for brand, and I'm going to go to audible instruments. Uh, this is all the stuff that um, is ported from the Mutable Instruments line of modules. Amazing stuff, open source, just a hugely cool resource for us to have available to us. And to start with, I'm going to uh, grab this thing called the Macro Oscillator 2. This is plates or plots. It's a cool little oscillator that doesn't need a VCA. Um, it'll just work for us in terms of sequencing, which is what we're going to start off with. So let's get the out of this attached to the input one of our... Whoa, sorry about that. <laughs> I forgot. If you don't have something put into the trig input here, it just goes. So we'll turn that off for right now. Um, and let us talk about what a sequencer is. They come in many different shapes and sizes, but basically a sequencer is something that is going to uh, create a sequence of voltages or events for us. Pitches, those can be just little triggers or gates. They can be... Uh, modulation. They can be all of those things. Um, but basically the idea is that Something is happening over time and creating events. And, um, you know, we take these things for granted in, you know, digital audio workstations or groove boxes or even things like, you know, the Mini Brute 2S, stuff like that. Those all have sequencers in them. In Eurorack, sequencers are um, very interesting. Like we can do all kinds of really, really interesting stuff with them. Before we get into like cool sequencers, I need you to understand the concept of clocks. Let's start getting a sequencer and some clocks in here. So I'm going to go back into the library. I'm going to search for LFO. And I'm going to grab this LFO. I'm going to search for seek. And I'm going to grab this SEQ3. And I'm going to go and search for clock. And I'm going to grab this CLKD thing from impromptu, which is a little clock generator. Go ahead and arrange these however you want. I like to move from left to right when I'm doing this kind of stuff. 
Okay, so what is a sequencer? Well, uh, see these little these little blinkings. We got blinkings all over the place here. These are uh, these are sort of pulses that are happening in time, um, and you can think of them in a couple different ways. And we will think of them in a couple different ways. A lot of us are uh, familiar with the concept of a tempo, you know, like a beats per minute thing. How fast is our song? And that is one way that um, uh, things can be expressed in here. So if I, for instance, grabbed this CLK1 out and I put it into our scope, and I took this out and I put it into here, we'd hear a very ugly beeping sound. And if we came over here to our scope, we would see something. A quick jump up and down from zero to the max voltage available to us. Remember, everything here is a voltage. This quick jump from zero to the max voltage here, this leading edge voltage, is what Eurorack generally looks at for a clock signal. And uh, it can be anything. Um, this is a particular, you know, this is a BPM right here, basically. Like this is uh, expressing 120 BPM. And you can hear the click on both sides of that clock as it turns on and off. Uh, if I was to make this go slower, you'd hear that there. Um, so this could be used as a clock. But I want to show you something. If I was to take this LFO right here, and if I was to take the square out and put it into here, you would see that uh, these look very similar, don't they? Uh, because they are. So um, a square wave LFO can be used as a clock as well. And there's lots of interesting opportunities for uh, both of these. Uh, if you want the uh, you know a, a tempo expression, you want your whole piece to sync to a BPM, then a clock generator like this probably makes sense. Um, but Let's start off with the LFO as a clock, just because we can. So first, I want to show you what happens when we take that signal and put it into something that, like an oscillator uh, to trigger that oscillator. So remember how we had this? All right, that's a free running oscillator. If we take the out here and put it into the trig input, you can see now we are triggering this oscillator and it's making a little sound for us. So that's one of the cool things about using LFOs is that you can uh, drive a whole a whole patch with uh, clocks that don't really have anything to do with a particular tempo, and you can modulate them over time. If I get another LFO going in here, and I modulate the frequency of the first LFO with a sine wave from the second LFO. We now have what I would call a variable clock. Okay, so we've established that an LFO can work as a clock, um, but what if we want something that's a bit more like, I don't know, sequency, that actually has like movement to it in terms of what it can do. Something that can send out different voltages. Well, my friends, that is where a sequencer comes in. So let's take a look at this SEQ3 that we added. See it blinking right here? It's already running. I can change the tempo and they run faster, and these knobs are going to send out control voltage. So let's go ahead and take the CV1 out, put it into here, and take this trig out and put it into here just so we can see what's going on. All right, so we talked about gates and clocks. Let me introduce you to trigs. Trigs are tiny little gates, basically. Most clocks that you're going to see are going to have what's called a duty cycle to them. I know, duty. The clock in the LFO has what's called a duty cycle to it, and a duty cycle is how long the wave stays high versus low. These are by default 50%, meaning that the frequency of this LFO, uh, whatever it is, or the timing of this BPM, um, has a particular rate to it, and it's gonna stay high for 50% of that and low for 50% of that. The LFO can actually be adjusted with pulse width. We can make this real tiny, see like that? Now it looks like a trigger, see? Looks like a trigger right here. Triggers have no width to them. Um, they're only used in a case where we just need a timing event to occur and we don't care about like sustain on an envelope or something like that, for instance, or we don't need something to stay open for a particular length of time. Um, but uh, they're very, very useful. And if we look at our macro oscillator here, we'll see that it has a trig in. So let's go ahead and connect that trig, this one right here on our sequencer, to the trig input of our macro oscillator. Okay, we are officially back to where we started with the LFO. We are triggering our plots, our macro oscillator, and it is making sound. But what about like changes to its pitch or something like that? Well, uh, we can do that too. 
that's going to be done with control voltage. So these knobs here are going to control the output of our step sequencer. And now you can see that our trigger and our voltage change with each other. If I was to take the CV output right here, the control voltage output, and put it directly into the volt per octave or pitch input of our macro oscillator, it's not going to sound very musical. That's because the voltage that's coming out of the sequencer is not quantized to the one volt per octave standard. If you don't understand what that means, please go watch the first video um, to explain it a bit better. But basically, volt per octave is the pitch standard that your rack works with. And uh, something has to spit out one volt per octave to sound like um, sort of tempered pitches. However, this will work as what's called modulation. So let's go ahead and put it into our timber or timbre input right here and turn up the attenuator for that. You can hear that now this control voltage is manipulating our timbre. We could put it into harmonics if we wanted to as well. Amazing, right? What if we wanted this sequencer to run at a particular tempo? Well, that's where this clock generator can come in. So if I take this CLK1 out and I put it into the clock input of our sequencer, we're not really going to hear a change because these were already thinking um, that they were both running at 120 BPM. But now if I change the tempo of this, we'll hear it get faster. Now, we have a choice here. This is where the difference between Eurorack clock and sort of like MIDI clock happen. In Eurorack clock, there are very few things that just kind of want to know what the tempo is. A lot of sequencers in Eurorack um, expect a regular pulse so they can like sort of decide what the tempo is. So like for instance, the Metron sequencer or the Maestro from uh, Acid Rain or a modulation thing like the ADE32, the abstract devices uh, octo controller. But a lot of the times clock is just a pulse to tell something to advance, meaning it doesn't know what a tempo is. It doesn't care. Like I can, I can send anything into this. It's like, check this out. I can take this square wave out from our LFO and put it into here. And then do that, change the frequency of this LFO. I could then do that modulation thing we did earlier. And our sequencer is now slowly going up and down in, in quote unquote tempo. Back to the clock generator. So if I put this back in a clock, this clock generator can send out pulses at different rates. So right now it's times one. We call that a pulse per quarter note or PPQN. There are different PPQN values like times two, which would technically be an eighth note, times three, times four. A lot of Eurorack sequencers expect this times four PPQ, which is technically a 16th note. Something like Pamela's new workout in the uh, hardware Eurorack world is really, really useful because it can send out uh, different PPQ rates on like eight different channels and you can have it drive your whole system's timing events. As you can see, sequencers come in all shape of sizes um, and all of these will act slightly, slightly differently. The next one we're gonna talk about is going to be the eight by eight gate sequencer, this one right here. Find that in your session and bring that on in. So right now, this thing is just going uh, one step at a time for every pulse that we put into it with our clock generator right here. We have determined that. And we can change this, but it's always regular, right? What if we wanted this to be a rhythm? Well, that's where like things that can actually do like gate sequencing come into play. And that's why we have this eight by eight gate sequencer here. So this is going to want a clock. So let's give it a clock. Let's take that clock out from here and put it into our clock input here. And now we can immediately see that this is running, isn't it? Look at it go. I'll turn the runoff on this thing real quick. So we have outputs from here. We have a gate output and a trig output. We're going to use a trig output for this, put it into clock. Trigs work great for clocks. Um, they don't really care about uh, duty cycle or any kind of width. So that should work just fine. If we hit run now here, 
nothing's going to happen because we need to give this some steps. What we get from this now is the ability to um, create rhythm, um, and that's what we're going to do. So let's go ahead and give some steps here. So this is what I meant by your rack clock, in some cases, and your rack sequencers are just a, hey, go forward, go go do the next thing. We don't really care about clock clock. Uh, we don't care about tempo tempo. We just want you to tell us to move forward or uh, go to the next order of operations. And that's what's going on here. I can speed this up. And the cool thing about this is because the number of steps that we have going on in our gate sequencer is one, two, three, four, five, but we have eight steps in our sequencer down here. So we're actually getting kind of a nice little polymeter going on. Uh, to drive this home, let's get another macro oscillator in here. I'm gonna hit Control D. The Platz macro oscillator has some really awesome uh, drum sounds in it. So I'm gonna click this here and go to this kick drum sound. I'm gonna go out into two. And then we're going to take the second trig output here and put it into trig. Let's go ahead and turn the frequency down of this macro oscillator like this. And let's give ourselves those two steps on our gate sequencer. So when you're thinking about how fast to run a sequencer, you want to think about the sort of like uh, the minimum quantization level that you might want to go, like the fastest note that you might want to go. A lot of the times that's 16th notes. So this is running at 16th notes, and that means I can do a four on the four beat right here, and then I can do this rhythm up here. If I was to slow down our PPQN to like eighth notes, this would run half as fast. And then if I was to run this down at one pulse per quarter note, I could still get that four on the floor by filling in those notes, but the rhythm on top would be much slower. Kind of like that 60 BPM thing there. Yeah, it's kind of nice. The other nice thing about using a clock generator like this or Pamela's new workout is the fact that we can stop and start the sequence with a run button. Let's talk about reset real quick. Um, reset, this input right here, this is an input to say, hey, you should start at the beginning of our sequence um, every time you get a thing in here. We have a reset out right here. I'm not sure if this one works. Let's find out. Let's just connect it to our reset inputs on our sequencers. Really weird thing with this. Um, let's take a look at what these signals are. I'm gonna take the reset and put it into the scope and I'm gonna take the run and put it into the scope. For some reason, this reset out does not seem, oh, you have to hit reset. Oh, okay. So uh, the run signal out here is a, a little trigger to tell a, a thing to run, but it's actually working how I would expect reset to work. See this blue line right here? Watch what happens when I hit run. See, sends out a little tiny pulse. And that's what's telling our reset things to start at the beginning again. You'll see it also hits on the end too. So in this particular clock, I would use run for reset um, and, unless you want to actually press that reset button there. I hope that makes sense. Like the basic idea here is that like sequencers like this that basically um, are just told to go forward once they get a trigger pulse have no concept of where they are in that sequence. So therefore, if you want things to start at the beginning every single time you hit start on a clock generator, you do need to send reset out. It's one of those dirty little secrets of Yorak that I don't know if everybody really, really thinks about. And actually I have a really extensive video on clocks um, uh, and hardware Yorak. If you want to check that out, I'll link it in the description. I think it's about time we got some pitch going on in here. We need to turn what's coming out of this into one volt per octave stuff. And um, the way that we're going to do that is with what's called a quantizer. So go up into your library and search for Make sure you clear your tags, search for a quantizer, and grab this little VCV rack quantizer. See that little computer keyboard? Isn't that cool? Let's take the CV2 out of this and put it into volt per octave. CV2 is gonna be this lane right here, and you can see as I turn the CV value that it is trying to pick a note there. It's turning that non one volt per octave stuff into volt per octave. So 
let's go ahead and reset this real quick. All right, go ahead and take the output of this and put it in the volt per octave of your main voice. And uh, let's hit play and we're gonna start turning some knobs and we're gonna hear some pitches. Now, it's not gonna sound very musical yet. The reason for that is because it's picking from the entire chromatic scale. So uh, let's go ahead and constrain this. We're going to do some note masking. We're going to pick just the notes we wanted to play. So for instance, that is the C major scale. But I like to quantize even further. I like to, to do what I call like note masking of a scale, which is to get rid of more notes. So let's go ahead and just pick some notes that you like. I like, I like something like this, where it's like C, D, uh, F, and G. Actually, if you wanna make this really easy, here, let's make it really easy on ourselves. Just pick the black notes here. There we go. So that's how we can take this sequencer here that we're using to make uh, modulation stuff and turn it into a pitch sequence. Let's add another macro oscillator to this. So pick this, hit Control D, and I want you to pick the, uh, let's see, this voice down here, this last red one. This is like a hi-hat. Right now, everything that we've done has been one for one, meaning um, it has been just like completely deterministic. Everything that we press here uh, does an action and we have no sort of like randomness or probability going on to this. But there's some fun ways that we can do that. And uh, there's a couple advanced ways that we'll get into later, but the first one I wanna introduce you to is called a Bertulli gate, I think. Anyways, go ahead and go to your library, go into brand, Audible instruments and look for this little thing. Bernoulli gate. Bernoulli. Not Bertulli. I'm such an idiot. Make some room for this right by your gate sequencer. Take, uh, let's see, trig out right here. Put it into in. And let's watch what happens. I'm going to take the third channel and put a trigger on every step. So every step is filled. Now, keep an eye on this LED when we hit play. See how it switches back between green and red? Over here, with the knob all the way on the left, it's fully red. Over here, fully green. This color means that one will go out through the A output and one will go out through the B output. So let's play with that a little bit. Let's go ahead and take this clock and replace it with the out A here. If I turn this to the left, it's going to play every single one of these. Turn it to the right, nothing's going to come out of this one, but it will come out of B. Take that out B, put it into the trig input of your new macro oscillator, and take the output of that and put it into another channel on your mixer. And then turn that down. <laughs> and turn the timbre up. And the frequency up. Oh, no, 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 don't do that. Uh, turn the frequency up and sort of adjust this until it's a nice little hi-hat sound. Cool. All right, now that we have a little hi-hat sound, we can put this back in the middle. And we can hear that this is now switching back and forth, probabilistically, meaning uh, with sort of a random chance between the thing that's feeding this sequencer and the thing that's triggering our hi-hat. The bottom one becomes a copy of this. So if you want to, you can do that and have two different channels. Now, the cool thing about this Bernoulli gate is it can be modulated. So this P knob, you can see that it has a little thing right here. Let's go ahead and put this back here and let's take that LFO we had earlier, that uh, sine wave LFO, this one right here, and put this into the P input. Now, in order to get this to work, you have to turn off the offset button right here so that it becomes bipolar. You can see over here now that we're crossing the zero line. So what that means is that it's going to move to the left and right of where this knob is as opposed to just up from it. So when it's high, it's going to be <laughs> fully on one side, like we talked about, and only one side will come out. In the middle, it's going to do both. And then on the right, it's going to only do the other one. So this is one way that you can get probability in your sequences. Another thing, fun thing that you can do with this is take the other side 
the out B, and this is just something that's kind of fun, and uh, put it into like a envelope generator. I'm gonna grab this ADSR, I guess. That's the smallest one we have. Make some room. Take the out of this, put it into the gate input here, and then adjust this like this. Take the out of this and put it into the voice of choice. Uh, we're gonna put it into the uh, morph of our hi-hat, for instance. So what just happened there? Well, we're using the second gate output of this to drive uh, the gate input of an ADSR, uh, envelope generator, which is then being used to modulate our hi-hat. This is where modular starts to get really interesting, is the ability that we have to use signals like gates and triggers to do a variety of things and really start getting kind of fun with that. Um, and, you know, the fact that like triggers and gates both can, uh, you know, trigger an oscillator, they can trigger a sequencer or move a sequencer forward, they can make a envelope generator do something, they can reset an LFO. So for instance, if I took this out here of the second channel, and put it into the clock input of our LFO, this is gonna get really strange. So let's go ahead and take the sine wave out of this and put it into, how about the morph input of our voice here? Now we've created an uneven clock. Uh, this thing expects a clock to sync to the LFO speed, um, but it uh, it doesn't know what's going on because it keeps on changing. So um, you can basically create a complex LFO very easily. Here, I'll show you what that looks like by sending um, an unstable clock into something that expects a clock. Look how confused that poor baby is, but it's really, really fun. You should You should definitely try that. So what if you need to clock an effect? Well, I'm here to show you that too. Let's grab an effect that wants to be clocked. In this case, it's going to be the Audible Instruments Chrono Blob, which is a cool little delay. Go ahead and go into your library and look for Chrono Blob. Chrono Blob is a uh, delay. And in this case, we're going to use it as an aux send. So um, this mixer that we have here, one of the reasons that I really like it is because it can send um, auxiliary signals out to an effect and um, you can send a certain amounts of all of your voices out to that thing um, and get a little bit of effect on everything if you want. The way that we do that is take this aux one left out, put it into here, aux one right out, put it into here, and then take the output of our Chrono Blob, or delay or effect, whatever you're using, put it into the six input and this input. I don't really like the labeling on this thing, but um, like it, <laughs> it does uh, it does a good job. It's just kind of hard to follow. There's a much easier to follow mixer um, that you can pay for. I just uh, it's kind of expensive for what it is. I'm not going to pay thirty dollars for a software mixer. I think that's kind of ridiculous. Um, if we hit play now and turn up. We've just sent some of this signal to our effect. One thing you want to do when you're using send effects is turn the dry wet all the way to wet right here. Now that's a mess. In fact, we'll go ahead and turn this down because we have a tempo here, but our delay isn't clocked. Now I could move this around and get an approximation of that, but I much prefer to sync it. And look here, there's a sync input. So the sync inputs wants a, it actually tells us sync trigger input. So it wants a trigger. Well, we have triggers. Let's grab one. Our clock over here can act as a trigger. So let's grab that and put it into our sync. Immediately, we are at a form of tempo. adjusting these attenuators down here to give us a little bit of stereo imagery. So when you see a sync input, keep an eye out for uh, a trigger that you can put into there to have your whole thing agree on the tempo of your piece. Now, just as if 
in the same way that we use the LFO over here with a clock that was confused, if you did that to this, let me show you what that sounds like real quick. Take the second out of your Bernoulli gate and put it into the sink here. Because we're sending in an uneven clock, it's kind of scooting all over the place, which is actually kind of fun. Don't sleep on uneven clocks because they can be really, really fun to send to things. But in this particular case, we're going to take a steady clock. All right, the next thing and last thing I want to show you is one of the key points of modular that I absolutely love, and that is separating your note on events from the note itself. In all synthesizers that you are probably used before, uh, many of you are watching this video, when you press a key, a couple things happen. A pitch event is sent, meaning a uh, pitch that uh, you expect the thing to play, and a note on event is sent, which usually you know triggers things like our envelopes. It's just those two are wedded um, in MIDI um, and software synthesizers. It's normally how things go. Um, so your rack doesn't care. Uh, we, can, <laughs> we can have um, anything do anything to something else, and that means that that we can separate our notes from our um, note on events. So I'm gonna show you that real quick. Okay, so how I'm gonna show you this is I'm gonna take our little scopey friends over here and scoot them over. And I'm gonna take this quantizer that's been doing our pitch and I'm gonna remove the volt per octave input from the sequencer. So let's listen to what this sounds like. That oscillator that was doing our pitches before is now stuck on one pitch. Um, but it is still getting its trigger from our sequencer here. Next up is we need to send something to this quantizer to get it to change pitches in a way that's very obvious. That our, I really want you to hear that our trigger events and our uh, pitch events are not um, connected to each other. So how I'm going to do that is I'm going to take this LFO and scoot it on over here. We're going to grab something called an attenuverter. Uh, so I'm going to right click and I'm going to go into brand and I'm going to go to Bifaco and I'm going to go over here to the dual attenuverter. Uh, I'll explain what this is doing in just a second. Take this LFO, take the sine wave out, put it into the input of your dual attenuverter, take the output and put it into the volt per octave of your quantizer and hit play again. Now slowly turn up the attenuverter. Can you hear what's going on here? I will show you uh, in our scope. Take a look at the scope we have over here on the right. This is what the LFO is doing. It's sending out a sine wave. See? We've put it into a quantizer, which is sending out quantized pitches. But before we did that, we sent it into this thing that allows us to control the value of the output. We have made the sine wave a bit smaller overall, because if we didn't, it would go too high and too low. So now you can hear that our pitch events and our note on events are completely separated from each other. One of the main uses that I do with this is to uh, separate uh, a long pitch sequence from a rhythm. So we're going to take, uh, as our last thing, I promise, we're going to take this last macro oscillator and we're going to pick, for instance, a nice deep bass thing like this. Let's go ahead and start giving this a uh, rhythm out of our gate sequencer. Next, duplicate the LFO, dual tenure rotor, and quantizer thing that you made earlier. Attach the LFO to the input of the attenue rotor, output into the volt per octave of your quantizer, and output of that into the volt per octave of your macro oscillator. Turn the offset way down, and the attenue version down as well. So we have one thing over here doing our rhythm for our bass, and this very slow LFO doing the pitch stuff for it. It's just happening. We don't have to worry about it. It's just doing it for us.
that concludes our second video on your rack in VCV rack. I hope this was fun for you, learning about clocks and sequencing. It's got a little more advanced than I expected, but it's always cool to have like a fun little patch at the end that you can play with. Uh, the next video is going to be about modulation. Um, though we have done a fair amount of modulation already, we're going to get deeper into it, plus some of my favorite um, you know, modulation modules that we can get for free in VCV Rec. <laughs>